Hitting the button. It is going. Here we are. Welcome. This is episode <clears throat> 16 <laughs> of Porn Stars, uh, which is part of the Herpeticulture Network, which is brought to you by blackboxcages.com. Check them out. Facebook, Instagram, go on the website, do some shopping. If you find something nice, throw it in the cart and then hit the discount code box, put in THN and check out, save yourself a little bit of money, get yourself a killer rack or a killer cage or both get a rack and then put a cage on top of it. I don't care. They're all awesome. doesn't matter which way you, you swing on the whole rack versus cage thing. There's something for everybody at blackboxcages.com. Absolutely. And then hop on over to the best unintentional breeder of corns <laughs> in the 2023 season. Yeah. Silent Hill Reptiles, Mr. I wasn't going to breed nothing this year, but now somehow has like, what, <laughs> nine clutches? No, it's more than that, I think. I think he's over 100 eggs. He's going to have more eggs than me this year. I've never I've never seen anything like it. Mm -mm. He's like, I'm not going to breed anything this year. I'm going to take it. I'm going to keep it, keep it minimal. Yeah. And then he keeps posting pictures of clutches that have been dropped and females yeah. that are about to drop. And it's like, what are you, what are you, like, I guess shit. I've been trying to breed for four years that won't breed for me. <laughs> it's just all like, yeah. No. I oops. I oopsied 130 eggs. My bad. Yep. So, be on the lookout. SilentHillReptiles.com. Also follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Because uh, I have a feeling his for sale page is going to be pretty full here soon. Yeah. And they're really good <laughs> pairs too. It's oh, really yeah. good yeah. shit. It's not you know what I mean. It's not a bunch of random random stuff. It's uh, you know, typical. On the Hill Reptiles level, stuff. So, go check them out. Absolutely. Uh, this round, we are joined by Elizabeth Nash of Burning Ember Reptiles. This is a, a fellow <laughs> Texan over there in Chris's neck Absolutely. of the, the woods and his third of the country, which is that entire state. The greatest <laughs> state of all states. Exactly. The state, the all consuming state of all states. Yeah. With a so, beautiful little baby joining us. How old is that? How old is that little one, Elizabeth? Um, she just turned three months. Oh, awesome. oh wow. And she's just waking up over there now. So, cool that's great. Con. I love it. Jealous. I, I miss that sometimes, those little bundles of just like the little noises and the little hands going. She's getting really cute. She's smiling all the time and she's starting to coo and talk to us and i think she's just on the verge of laughing for the first time so yeah that's awesome yeah then you'll, you'll they'll start reacting to certain things a lot of their favorite stuffy and then you get your first words and then mm -hmm. they walk then, then they, they graduate uh, then they ruin your life <laughs> yeah they're uh they're amazing little girl right yes awesome uh well, uh, well, we'll jump right into it, Justin. Let's get a little season update. How, how's the how's the how's the world going on your side? Uh, pretty good. The let's see, I have that that ghost tessera clutch is in the incubator. Um, everything looks is looking looking solid there. And then as of like two or three days ago, I got a clutch from the Jansen Eye, which is a pretty big deal. That's amazing. Yeah. What an animal. Uh, those that's a pair that I've been I've been working with and, and working towards this for you know at least two years. Got a clutch last year, they were all duds. So I've been patiently waiting for the next round. Uh, this time it was a lot a lot better because I was you know, I figured out she was gravid ahead of time and <clears throat> yeah. Could plan accordingly and got another clutch of three. It looks like there's only one good egg out of the batch, but the one good egg looks really, really good. And like it's yeah, perfect. that's awesome. So, that's awesome. The uh, the next next hurdle is now incubation and seeing if we can go the distance there because their yeah. incubation time is ridiculously long. It's like 145 days or so. Whoa, it's nuts! Is that kind of typical for all Ganyasoma? Uh, at least like the true Ganyasoma, yeah, yeah. Because everything else is, is pretty straightforward and, and normal in terms of colubrids. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. The, like the Cyania, the Boigo were, were just as – they took a long time too, like yeah. a longer time, like triple digit. I think 110 days if I'm not mistaken. That's cool. Um, 
and I don't know. I mean, they have a really, really thick eggshell too, and I'm, I'm starting to wonder if that's like a, a tropical Asian species kind of thing, where maybe it's because there's like we've talked about with the desert stuff. Yeah. Um, similar to where like all that stuff is sort of adapted to that environment, and they have a thicker shell, maybe with moisture regulation or something along those lines to keep them from from either getting too wet or maybe drying out. Yeah. Um, so keeping them on a little on the drier side. Uh, and then I dropped the incubator down to just a flat 78, mm-hmm. which is where it's going to ride. Um, corn eggs and everything else that go in there are going to yeah, be, be fine. the same thing. So, um, yeah. And then the, so basically like it's been a, a process of steps, you know, getting, getting the, the pair and figuring out it was a pair was sort of step one. It was like, cool. That's a step in the right direction. Sure. Getting that first clutch of eggs, even though they were duds, like that was a major step in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And then kind of getting this one to where it's like, okay, now I have a chance to actually get incubation, uh, making that happen, which is yeah. like the biggest challenge with, with Ganyasoma is getting those eggs to, to go the distance and hatch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Especially cause we're in an environment, nothing like where they're at. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So it'll it's be interesting. Like, it's going to be, it's, it's the trials. So the, the O3 Ophis, I know some of the species in that group have mm-hmm. really long incubations, uh, I think the the hundred flower rat snakes. Oh, uh, the, the, yeah, it starts with an M. It's Molendorfi. Molendorfi. Yeah. yeah, they have extremely long incubations, and again, it's a similar thing. They, they, you have to be mm-hmm. really careful with the eggs. Uh, I've got beauty eggs in the incubator right now, and they're honestly, you kind of handle them like a uh, corn snake eggs. They just take a little longer, 70, 75 mm-hmm. days. Uh, which they decided to breed again today, which was interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I've never, I've never intentionally double clutched them. In fact, I cohabbed them for a long time, and they never double clutched. Yeah. Uh, but I had them together while I was cleaning. Opened up the tub, and they were locked up. Uh, so. Well, what's really bizarre too with the gun, like the true Ganyasoma in particular, is like oxycephalum. Uh, they'll double clutch. Like you'll get multiple clutches in a year. I think you'll get two. Typically, is not uncommon. But with Jance and I, you get like one. Like you get your one shot, and that's kind of huh. it. Um, God, dude, if it goes the distance, which that's is going to be so it's damn odd amazing. because they're they're like they're so similar. Yeah, but they kind of like in terms of breeding and stuff. They're yeah, much they're, they're different. You know, they're not like the the cyania. They were gonna you know you breed those and boiga and stuff in general. Like you're gonna get two clutches. Well, you know, it's not uncommon. Like my female laid that one clutch they hatch and this, those were hatching she dropped a second clutch that was just as perfect as the first yeah. and it, like, you don't have to do anything you were getting that regardless so it's interesting we'll see um gave her some weaned rat pups or weaned rats not pups uh yeah. and she hammered those so i'm definitely trying to beef her up some and matt most mentioned calcium is a very big thing with them and sort of making sure you get 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 them supplemented a little more to bounce back because i guess calcium crash is kind of a bigger thing with with them in particular which i also find interesting um so we'll see i mean all around interesting species yeah very very odd yeah just big angry white and black snakes those things are pissed those are those are like the actual most pissed snakes i don't know man those percentum i think take the cake oh yeah those those little things are firecrackers dude like the jance and i they have a certain level of, of tolerance for, for your bullshit. Mm-hmm. And they kind of, they're, they're very clear about when they've hit that limit. Yeah. Uh, the person of them, it's like, no, I have like that. This is how much clearance you get before we're, we're taken to that, that extreme coming in hot. Uh, yeah. So it's a cool, it's a cool group. I'm glad it's happening. Um, rhino rat female looks like she is in the process of having some eggs happening. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been cuddled up a good bit lately. They, I think they've the, both the male and female that they are now cohabbed. Um, I think they've really kind of fallen into a groove in terms of getting used to each other being around all you know each other all the time. Because at first that male would not leave her alone; he'd chase her everywhere. Yeah, and she was really hiding exciting. a lot, which is very unusual for them because they're almost always out and about. So they're now kind of getting to the point where I think they're, you know, they've kind of accepted each other's presence and. Getting into the groove there, and I got a confirmed block from them. It would have been, I think, a week or two ago, probably closer to two weeks. Um, and she's starting to look pretty, pretty thick towards the, the last third. So I'm thinking we're going in the right direction there. That's awesome. Um, waiting on the female Ladies <laughs> Island corn that was paired with the Castagna Motley male 
to drop any day now. She had her prelay shed coming up on, I think, two weeks ago. Um, and she's really holding out. I don't know. She doesn't look as grab like the gravid situation with her. She doesn't. She doesn't look as gravid as she has in the past with other eggs. Yeah. So I'm wondering what's going to come out of that. You know, I, I wouldn't. For some reason, I'm suspecting that that if I do get eggs out of that clutch, there. I don't know that there'll be a lot of good ones. Um, yeah. We'll see. I don't know. Something just seems off about it. That that ghost tester girl laid a perfect clutch, and she was yeah. definitely like picture poster child gravid um mm -hmm. you know the definition of it and she's a so good we'll snake man that's a good snake yeah yeah those eggs were flawless i don't think there was a bad one in the, in the clutch it was a clutch of 11 which i think is the same number she gave me last year which is interesting i think it's consistently been like 12 or 11 yeah a couple yeah. times i've read her yeah <clears throat> and uh the loma alta bairds she is um sort of on the tail end of her prelay shed oh mm. So that'll be a bunch of het hypo beards. That'll be cool with the low be nice. Yeah. So, Good and then the I think that's that's pretty much it. I I did pair another. I put another younger pair of bears together. I mean, not younger. They're they're older still animals, but they're just smaller. Mm -hmm. I put them together. I put that Davis Mountain male in with one of the other undocumented sort of eastern phenotype animals that I have, and I don't know that anything happened. I'm keeping an eye out just to see, but. That was kind of a last minute, like let's just see what happens, kind of thing. So yeah, but that's it. That's cool. Yeah, that's good. That's a lot, dude. The Jan tonight. Woo! That's gonna be awesome. I'm. I'm. I'm I, if I hatch out a freaking needles, baby of those, dude, I'm gonna freaking cry. Yeah, that's. I'm gonna solve those species that. Like it's the Nicholas Sparks movie. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, how many people in the United States have ever even bred them? I mean, a handful. I probably could count them on both hands. Maybe. Yeah. It's. Most of the, I think a lot of the people though that have hatched them, it's from you know like underground and all those importers. Like they get a mm. lot of females that are gravid, and so they come in and they incubate the eggs and stuff. Gravid like that. females, so, I mean, that's or one thing. Females that pair with but the male that they got. Yeah. In terms of people that have like intentionally bred them because they want to reproduce them, um, it's really it's not a lot. No. Off the top crazy. of my head, I mean it's like I know, I think Rob Stone did years and years and years ago. Uh, Daniel Schwint is currently the only guy I know of that has at least recently produced any, but that's just what you see on online. You know, who knows yeah. what else is going on? Oh, there's, there's the, some those like people that like to stay in their old guy that yeah. has a garage full of them. Probably. Right? Yeah. Yep. He's got a tattoo on his face. He just doesn't want to talk to any humans. Uh, well, yeah, I've got, I've got a bunch of corn eggs on the ground. Uh, Amel Motley girl laid 12, 11 or 12 perfect eggs. Uh, my little snow, my little house project, my my yellow necks, uh, so the, the yellow neck annery stripe boy who's head ultra um, went to his sister this year, who is the snow kind of real deep yellow neck, uh, and she's going to be either head motley or head stripe because dad is head is uh, phenotypically motley but is head for both, um, mm -hmm. so that clutch if she's motley will be all motleys if she's striped it'll be all stripes so that'll be kind of interesting but they'll all be het both um she's gonna be one so we'll figure that out uh no tester in that clutch was kind of exciting 12 good eggs so i'll have a whole bunch of ultra male snow tramel yellow neck things i don't know but they're all going to be ultra male annery they're all going to be annery half will be ultra male uh half will be motley or stripe and we'll figure it out from there it's gonna be an exciting clutch uh pewter girl is on the tippy toes of lane any day yeah uh, my heavy uh heavy reverse okatee girl is on the gonna lay any day gosh if i get some ultra male okatees you're gonna you're gonna hear your boy that'll be nuts yeah i'll be really excited kind of bummed there's tessera in there um that's kind of one of those clutches i wish i had a really nice ultra male male for mm -hmm. that wasn't tessera um but we'll go from there maybe i'll, I'll hold a male back uh, my, oh, Silent Hill, uh, Hannibal, Children of Hannibal pairing, uh, is due to ha uh, lay any day. Um, gosh, there's, uh, my blood red pied female, het charcoal, so het pewter, uh, girl, again, gonna lay any day. Uh, what did you pair that pewter female to? Charcoal, het blood red, tessera boy. That's right. So I'll get, uh, charcoal, tessera charcoals, pewters, tessera pewters. Uh, and whatever residual heads may be in there, you never know when you're pairing right. two new snakes. 
fucking might get a you know a stripe or something. We'll see. Uh, I think that's it for corns. I know there's another corn in there. Oh, uh, Carrie. So the mother of my yellow neck project. I went back to the original pairing. Yeah. Uh, so she's Annery, Het Sunkiss, Het Stripe, Het Amel. Uh, back to the dad who's Motley Tesser, Ultra Mel, Het Amel, Het Annery. Sorry. And that's the ones that have produced those. And that snake you have, that male you have, that's who produced that. So, and then I sent you a picture of that Tessera that was mm-hmm. also produced in that clutch, which I mean nobody knows what's going on because I I have hatchling pictures and I have adult pictures and they're two different animals and I don't know where that change happens and I don't know what's happening and everybody I've talked to nobody knows what's happening, so it's almost like Castania, right? It almost looks, yeah they come out looking completely normal and then within yeah. a couple of sheds it just completely flips. Mm-hmm. But it's only on the anneries that it does it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what else is going on? Uh, my first clutch of Leonis were all slugs. That happens nah. first time, girl. Uh, I do have one other gravid Leonis, and the other Leonis just doesn't look like she's gravid. Had a ton of locks with her. Uh, just don't don't know what's going on there. Uh, Crips Fountain, uh, Alterna. I can I palpate five eggs in her for sure. So she's gonna she's gonna go soon, hopefully. Uh, lay those uh, both of my Dark Knight project alternas, the three mile west, uh, tons of locks. They're they're big females, so I don't really see the the kind of uh, uh, the eggs descending at all on them. They don't really swell up too much. Uh, gosh, there's there's more. Oh, I got Jani eggs in the incubator. I got Chinese beauty eggs in the incubator. I've got locks from my northern pines. I've got locks from my vertebralis. Uh, McMullen thorn scrubs. Uh, the females gravid, so that's the aberrant wild caught that we found uh, in McMullen, and then the uh, female that we found the same night that's not aberrant. So we'll see how that gene works, uh, and then my reverse stripe Nueces County thorn scrubs have been locked in left and right, and I do have confirmed locks with my albino MAI to my reverse stripe Nueces County. So hopefully that generates the plan that I've been working on for like four years now uh, to to get aberrant het albino thorn scrubs to hopefully pair up and get a reverse stripe bob. I know many years down the road. Uh, other than that, a lot of stress, a lot of feeding, a lot of a lot of money being spent on mice uh, because that's uh, that's what we do. Um, I don't think I've got anything else going on breeding-wise. I, I'm ready for it to be over, and I'm kind of at the point where I'm not pairing anything else. Like, whatever happens at this point, I'm just, that's it. Yeah. I'm going to... I'm going to feed these things and just keep them fat and happy and, and sleep a little better because that's some, some, Oh, uh, my Baja California Kings that like to try to eat each other. The females do delay any day. So, uh, that's always a stressful, you know, 26 hours of copulation, uh, followed by try to eat the male the entire time, uh, stay up all night, check on them. Super, super duper fun. Uh, I suggest everybody that breeds snakes, try it. Um, but tonight I'm super excited. Uh, you know, a few years ago at the Corpus uh, Herbs Reptile Show, I got to meet Elizabeth, who's our guest today. Uh, she's the uh, owner-operator of uh, Burning Ember Reptiles, uh, and she's a sweetheart. She's extremely nice. I got her into gargoyle geckos, as every human should get into gargoyle geckos. <laughs> um, so, Elizabeth, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I can't complain much. Uh, getting some sleep with the baby, thankfully. That is <laughs> the best like the first full nice rest you get you're like i've never been happier she's been she's been really good she started sleeping through the night probably around six or eight weeks oh wow so yeah super lucky we've been really lucky with her <laughs> that's great but uh yeah i've been trying to stay busy with the snakes we uh we cooled everybody late this year just knowing that we were going to be having the baby in january yeah, yeah. um and trying to play around that because husband works weird hours and you know I'm kind of just doing the snakes all by myself and raising the baby so uh, I was kind of trying to keep him cool for as long as I could while she was new new while we were trying yeah. to figure stuff out but uh, we got her figured out and we probably just woke our snakes up at, like mid to late March nice. um, maybe early April um, they haven't been awake very long but uh Needless to say, I don't have any eggs yet. I have had uh, one, two, three, three or four locks, I think. Um, there's been a couple that, uh, you know, I think they may have locked because they're looking a little snugly with each other, but I didn't actually see them lock. Um, and, you know, I don't 
I won't call it a lock unless I actually see it or, yeah. you know, she's grabbing it later on down the road. But um, I have some high suspicions on a couple of them that, you know, I think they may have locked. Um, and then I haven't started breeding anything other than my corns yet, except for hog noses. We do have some Western hog noses with a good friend of ours um, for like a partnership breeding. Mm hmm. Um, and we do have babies already of Western hog noses. So that's pretty cool. As far that's as awesome. what genetics yeah. we're working with on those, uh, I'm not the person to ask because the hog noses <laughs> are my husband's thing. Um, yeah. I feed them and I pack them up into delis whenever we need to deliver them to somebody at a show. And that's about it. <laughs> hog nose genetics are interesting. They fall somewhere between ball pythons and corn snakes. And I'm just like, I don't know how any of this shit. I know. It's, <laughs> it's a... I haven't even tried ever to learn ball python genetics. I'm never going to be on that page. There's like thousands of morphs and I yeah, can't. I don't know. I don't know. I know it's know crazy. There's, there's people out there that that's what they do, right? Like they mm -hmm. know all of it. And, and kudos to them because that is a wealth of knowledge that is very. And the people that can like fire it off when they see something. They're uh -huh. like, you know, that's a, a, a rose flower sideway, upside down uh, tic tac avocado. <laughs> oh, that's got definitely got avocado in it. That may be super avocado. <laughs> And it's like, oh, obviously, right? Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, there's probably like 200 morphs that look like a normal. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, yeah, shockingly true. Yet mm -hmm. the best looking ball python is still just an albino pie, in my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is like, I don't know, man. A good Mojave is hard to beat. A nice looking just because that's like, kind of been I that like Mojave's. Type. Yeah. It's a. Uh, Anyways, this is not a ball python show. I also, we don't need to go. I also um, signed me up for a really nice pastel. I don't like. Yeah. I'm yeah. extremely basic when it comes to that kind of stuff. The old, what was the old one that was like super expensive? Uh, bumblebees or queen bees? I, I forget there was something in yeah. there. Yeah. Something with the spider gene, which I know is kind I of got the military. It's just spider it. and pastel was a bumblebee. Something like that. Yeah. But those are badass mm -hmm. looking. Mm -hmm. uh, really pale yellow and black. Mm hmm. Yeah, but uh, not too much happening over here quite yet. That's okay. When I mean, did you, you, this, you have your hands full, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. when did you put stuff down if you put it down later? Like, what was the... Did you time uh, it where it was just before Baby showed up? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Mom brain is killer. Uh, <laughs> it was pro Yeah, it was probably pretty right before she got here. She was born late January. Um, okay. So I think, I think it was probably late... December, probably that we put them down. Um, this was my first year brewmating stuff. Um, oh, nice. I've never really had to in the past. I've always had, you know, pretty good luck with them. Yeah. Um, as far as just like kind of natural temperature dropping in our facility uh, with the winter and the shorter days and everything, I've never really had to do much. Mm -hmm. um, but we decided to give it a go this year. And so far, I haven't really noticed a difference in as far as like ease of breeding or whenever I pair them or watching for sheds or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, it's just, we didn't feed the majority of our collection for a couple of months and we saved some money. <laughs> yeah. That's, I totally understand because I'm yeah. the exact same way. I, uh, but, it's that's, that's a I've, real deal. I've done it with the beards, but I haven't done that with corns here. And I'm maybe that's something I'll, I'll give a shot. You know, next go around, but it's not brewmating, not brewmating, but just taking them off food. Yeah, you know that's because my room, same thing. Like winter rolls around, and it naturally gets cooler in the house. You know, regardless of we don't really turn the heat on all that much unless we really have to, and it has to be pretty cold for that. But even the, uh, you know, there's a I have a window, so even the daylight hours and stuff drastically change. So. I've been yeah. curious. I've done it with the bears, no problem. But the you know the corns, I have not been brave enough to try it out yet. But you know the Jani, for the last few years, I've just been pairing up in December and feeding them like a slightly less instead of every seven to ten days is maybe every ten to fourteen. And uh, man, you know what? Putting those snakes in a box for three and a half months felt real good when I brewed them this year. And they they locked and they were still some of the first eggs I got. Uh, and I got, I, the first time I bred them, I think I got nine good eggs. Second time I bred them, I got 10 good eggs. And this time I got 10 good eggs. So I can't, wow. 
I can't tell you there's a difference uh, in, in either brumating or doing the fall breeding like people say to do. Or, uh, But you know what? That was that was a whole bunch of uh, small rats I didn't have to thaw out. And uh, <laughs> at, at, for what, 60 bucks for 15 small rats or whatever it is now, 30 or 45, oh, God, it's expensive. It's They're, stupid. Mice prices are not going to be going down. Nope. Uh, so. And they won't, they don't really like chicks. They're like one of the one species I have that just absolutely will not take chicks. Hmm. So who knows? Anyways, uh, Elizabeth, I know, I know, I know a little bit of your background, uh, but can you tell us, you know, you don't need a full backstory on every detail, but what got you into snakes and, and specifically into corn snakes? Um, so basically I've liked snakes pretty much my whole life. It took a lot of convincing to get my mother to let me have a snake. Um, but when I was probably a sophomore in high school, she finally agreed to have a snake in the house. And, um, we had this, uh, local website, kind of like Craigslist, but just local to the area that I was living in at the time. And I just got on there and looked for snakes for sale and I wasn't really sure what I wanted. Um, but I found somebody that posted that they had multiple corn snakes for sale and I know absolutely nothing, and there's no pictures on this ad. They just pretty much have the morphs that they had available, and they had, like, Miami and Okatee and, um, I think, Butter. And so I'm, like, Googling all these, and I settled on a Miami, which was Ember, which is who we named our business after. Nice. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. Uh, I didn't have him very long before I started getting more and a bunch of my initial snakes actually came from that same person. Um, and she, her name's Rachel. Um, you may have seen her on Facebook. She owns uh, sky pony reptiles. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and she's been, uh, my mentor and really, really good friend since probably about 2015. And we actually named our daughter after her. So <laughs> we, uh, wow. she, she got That's me wonderful. into it That's pretty awesome, heavy yeah. and she's taught me pretty much everything that I know. Um, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, I went from one snake to three snakes to close to 200 snakes. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, I blinked and uh, they took over my life. <laughs> it happens so quick. It, yeah. It? yeah. <laughs> it, it, something happens in that collection stage where you've got five or 10 or something and you're like, all right, I'm going to do this. And then all of a sudden you've got like a hundred and something. One, like, two, <laughs> 30. Yep. Yeah, it gets uh, bad when you start getting babies and you're like, well, that's a hold back. That's a hold back. That's a hold back. That's a hold back. They're all hold backs. Yeah. <laughs> they're every, every snake I hatch is a hold back until I decide it's not. Mm hmm. Uh, so, so what does that collection look like? You said almost 200 snakes. What, I know you have different species and stuff, but what, uh, what would, what would you say it looks like? Um, as far as like what kind we have, like which species we have, or you know, like how many corns, how many, how many other species? Um, so we're predominantly corns and western hognoses. Um, they're probably about neck and neck with each other as far as how many we have. Um, probably a little more corns, especially now since we just got some stuff from Ian. But uh, we have mostly corns and hognoses. And then I have a small collection of Splendida mm -hmm. um, that I'm working with. I've got some uh, a snow project going on with them, some exanthics, some albinos. And then I've got just some normal stuff. Some Don Shore um, stock? Uh, my main exanthic male did come from Don Shores. Um, my bigger female, we actually bought her from some good friends of ours. We were buying some other stuff from them and they said, oh, well, we've got this Florida King. Are you interested in her? And at the time I had Florida Kings and we're like, yeah, sure. Go on, go ahead and bring your little buyer off you. And, uh, I get her and I'm like, this is not a Florida King. <laughs> this is a <laughs> desert King. And, uh. So she actually started the Desert Kings for me, and I just, I don't know why I like them more than many of the other king snakes. They're uh, really I, good snakes. They're they're great. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I really don't have any complaints with them so far. Um, and then we've got, what else do we have? Really the only other thing we have, I've got one pair of uh Christmas Mountain gopher snakes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and they they bred for me last year. They actually came from uh, Walter Smith. Oh wow, wow! Um, it, out of his collection sellout. Um, I yeah, got I've, I've seen that they're gorgeous. Gophers. They have that super crisp red uh, uh -huh. bordering on their saddles. They're really pretty snakes. Um, they bred for me last year. Um, we ended up moving right at the tail end of like 
incubation time and they hadn't hatched yet and they ended up losing that clutch as well oh. as two corn clutches oh, in yeah. our move um i just i tried and it it just didn't go well but we'll try them again next year um nice. she hasn't shed yet since they came out of brumation so we're watching her for that but she's slamming her rats and she's probably my most expensive snake to feed <laughs> yes they're yeah. very expensive yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, would, I would pair them before sheds though uh most of my pitiophis uh breed after brumation before shed uh, okay i'll probably fact, just all of them do. okay i'll probably just cohab them yeah let they're, them do that they cohab well too like sometimes they're pissy to us <laughs> But they kind of just puddle up in a little corner together, and it's like, nah, y'all are fine. My male is a big puppy dog. He's yeah. a big baby. Um, I used to, when we did, uh, when we lived up further north up in Palestine, we did, like, kids' birthday parties with reptiles and stuff. And I would always bring him um, and blow the kids away with this gigantic gopher snake. Uh, but um, the female, not so much. Not so <laughs> much. She's, she's not for the faint of heart. She's one that whenever she has to get messed with my husband calls me into the room because he doesn't want to deal with her <laughs> is that a thing are... with is that a thing with pits though chris because uh, like females... my males are super chill jake's most of jake's males are really chill but his females are like a completely different story you find females are usually less temperate right like they, they have they get they get <clears throat> distressed and and more uh they, they they get pissed off a little quicker uh definitely the case with females uh, males are demons when it comes to eating, though. I've, every bite I've gotten my from southerns are just my southerns are so they don't care. You know, just really, like, whatever. My every bite I've gotten from a pitchophus was a feeding response, and it was a male every time. Uh, hmm. My males, I, I have to open my males' tubs with a hook. Uh, they will come flying out uh, when it's after it's been a couple days. You know, you feed them, they're fine for two days because it's a pitchophus and they've already pooped through their tub. Uh, but the uh, females are definitely a little more defensive, and and once they get there, once they're once a bitchy ophis is mad, it's not coming down, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna like set it down or hold it just long enough so that it's gonna be all right. I'm gonna handle it now. No, they're just pissed, they, and then they <laughs> they get then they do that huge inhale, exhale, the big, and then and, and it, it just never goes away, and you're like, all right, we're just we're just done here. We're just done for the day. <laughs> yeah, let's try doing. again tomorrow yeah and the, and the gophers have a you know i the one i found on uh in black gap uh last year god it was a female she was just gorgeous but they have this massive display just this huge obnoxious just uh glorious defensive pissness and and it's specifically the gophers from west texas i i swear the loudest and the fussiest uh but god those are gorgeous and and, and like i said you you post pictures of those uh those crystal mounts there, beautiful. Those are beautiful animals. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to have them. I've thought about selling them a couple of times, um, but it's one of those things. Like if somebody gives me this price for them, I'll let them go. But yeah. I'm not in a hurry to move them at all. Yeah, I, I sold all my gopher snakes, uh, with the exception of my Baja gophers, my my vertebralis. But I've kept all my pine snakes, um, and it's, it's a space thing. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. It, they're, yeah, they're not small. <laughs> no. And, 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 and you know this, cleaning an adult gopher snake that's five, six foot long, it could mm -hmm. be even bigger than that. Full-time job. It, it's a full-time job. A whole because, roll of paper towels. <laughs> oh, my yeah. gosh. And, and it's never – it's never a, you don't spot clean pitchy ovis. And that's no. what I've explained to people that have bought them from me. You don't get to spot clean pitchy ovis. You do. It's just that spot ends up being like half the cage. The so you might as well spot is half the tub. And uh, – but what's still wonderful animals, and I'm glad I'm glad you still have because I know that at one point you were thinking about selling them. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm glad you're I'm glad you're going to hold on to them. They're they're, they're fun. They're, it's neat to have that spice in there. Uh, well, awesome. Uh, you know, I was gonna I was gonna kind of talk a little bit about previous seasons compared to this season, uh, but I'm kind of interested in asking you about your thoughts on not brewmating before we even get too much further. You, you said in previous seasons you've not brewmated. Uh, what did your success rate look like? Um, I never really had problems. Every once in a while, I would have a stray female that I just couldn't get to breed. Um, but usually when that happens, it's, it's, it's out of the blue, and it's usually just maybe one per season. I did have one female. Uh, she probed female. She would 
act female whenever I would put her with other snakes. Could not get that snake to breed once. I tried her for three seasons. She never bred. No idea why. But as far as not brewmating and breeding, um, I, you know, I had my normal couple of slugs per clutch or I would sure. have perfect clutches. Um, I've really never had a whole slugged out clutch unless it was a brand new female with a brand new male and they were young. But uh, as far as, you know, success rate, I, I really haven't had any issues without permitting. Awesome. And you so, would, would, would you cycle the feeding at all or just wait until, you know, early in the year and start pairing? Nope. I would just wait until they started uh, probably around the time I saw people posting on Facebook that they were breeding, I would start pairing <laughs> mine together. <laughs> I just kind of let everybody else set the bar for me. But yeah. uh, I'll watch the females too. And if I start noticing they're, they're a little puffy, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pair them up. But uh, no, I, uh, I didn't cycle feeding or anything. I just set them like I would any other month or any other time of the year. Um, probably the only like I said, the only difference I've noticed with brewmating so far is just uh, we're not spending as much money on feeders. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice break. And not as much time. So probably mm -hmm. going forward, the only reason we would brewmate would probably be to just kind of get a break on feeders. Um, because honestly, they're probably a little slower to lock up and breed this year than they are when I don't brewmate them. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you, uh, so on the feeder aspect, kind of dip into that, do you uh, buy frozen thawed, buy live, or do you breed your own? Uh, so we used to breed our own before we moved. Um, we used to have a, a whole big building that all of our uh, animals were in, our reptiles and our feeders. Um, but when we moved, we couldn't bring the building with us, and we kind of had to shrink down, and now everything's just in a bedroom in our house. And I don't want a ton of live feeders in my house <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> and we don't nope, have a garage or anything. So uh, we're back to just buying. We do have like one tub of mice and one tub of rats okay. um, just to kind of have uh, live. If we have something that wants to eat live, like I have a retic and every once in a while he gets into a mood where he just wants to eat live. Um, and then it's nice to have live pinkies uh, for stubborn babies. Absolutely. That eat. Especially corns. Yeah. Uh -huh. Live live feeders for corns for babies is and top notch. The hog noses they help us a lot with the hog noses too, because mm -hmm. uh, hog noses are a pain in the butt. They kind of hate you the whole time, right? Uh huh. <clears throat> but uh, no, we just have one small colony of rats and mice, and then other than that, we buy a uh, frozen. Uh, we live pretty close to Bart with the rodent shop. Oh, perfect. Uh, so yeah. I just drive out there and get from them every month or so. Dallas area. No, we moved. Okay. We were up in Palestine, but we moved down to Conroe. Oh, uh, Conroe, so perfect. A little oh, yeah. Houston. I love, I love Conroe, the woodlands, all that area. It's not mm -hmm. only just gorgeous, but it's kind of tame compared to Houston. So, it's yeah. it it's been great, except for uh, last weekend when there was a murderer on the loose. Hmm. Yeah, Always they ended the thing, up. Right? He you. he killed five people, and Holy they caught shit. him. Uh, day before yesterday, I think they caught him in the neighborhood right across the street from ours. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That is specifically terrifying. Sorry. Yeah, it, was, that. It, was, it was a little terrifying, but, you know, we were locked and loaded. If he came through the door, he wasn't going to go back out the door. <laughs> this time. Walking anyway. They check in, but they don't check out. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. But uh, yeah, no, that, we, we like the area. It's pretty good. It's really pretty. Yeah. That, that lot of, lot of, lot of really nice piney areas, lots of trees, mm -hmm. a lot of good herping around that area too. Kind of from that area, uh, east of Beaumont, uh, mm -hmm. there's some, uh, Louisiana milks in that area. And, you know, so, um, maybe... wait, if Chris is in Corpus, where is Conroe from there? No. Uh, about five and a half hours Northeast. Okay. Five hours, maybe. If you got to go okay. through Houston, it's like 12 hours. Yeah. Depends on what time we'll you leave. Be, we'll be down in Corpus here in a few months, so I'll let you know how long it takes us to get there. August show, yeah. Yeah. But, well, uh, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. I've been meaning to get out and herp some. I've got a bunch of friends in the area. I just It's a little hard with a newborn. Uh, a lot of a lot of things become difficult. <laughs> with Damn kids will throw a lot of monkey wrenches into your plans. Yeah. 
the tell me about my race car that hasn't been driven in six years that's sitting yeah. next to me. <clears throat> uh, so uh, as as you're doing pairings, uh, you know we're, we're, you do a lot of corns, uh, a few other species. But what are your what are your favorite pairings? You know what kind of defines uh, burning ember? Um, so I've I've kind of been all over the place the past couple of years. Um, I had a really really nice pair of fluorescent reverse opatis um, nice. that I absolutely loved. I unfortunately lost my female coming out of formation this year. Um, which absolutely broke my heart, but I've got Sorry. some babies from her. So hopefully uh, I can get them raised up and start again with that. Um, but uh, I've got a lot of sun kissed stuff and a lot of hypo stuff this year. Um, probably one of my favorite pairings this year. I did them last year. It's off of a male from Eric with ECW and a female from yeah. Joe Peck. Um, and last year they gave me some Miami honeys. They gave me, um, some really nice caramel Miamis. Um, they gave me some sun-kissed Miamis. Um, and he's posset for Amel. I don't know. I didn't get any Amel in the clutch. Uh, I don't know if it's going to prove out or not. It didn't prove out last year. Um, but I did just get a lot of Miami, just plain Miami in the clutch last year. Yeah. So. Um, I'm bringing them back to each other again this year. Um, and then we've got some Palmetto stuff that we'll be working with this year. I got a uh, Het Palmetto Sunkissed Hypo Annery female from okay. Ian. Um, so hopefully we can get some different types of Palmettos. And then probably the one I'm most excited for that we haven't really told anybody about yet. Um, we've got a micro scaleless male from Ian that we're going nice. to pair to an Anary Tessera <clears throat> Het scaleless strawberry stripe, I think. No, okay. Amel. No stripe. Scaleless <laughs> Amel strawberry. And okay. our micro scaleless is Het blood red Het Amel, I believe. Okay. Um, A lot of possibilities and, there. Yeah, so we're kind of trying to figure out because they just figured out last year that microscale and scaleless are allelic. Um, ah, so okay. we're trying know. to figure out kind of what, how it all works if you pair a microscaleless to just a scaleless or to just a microscale. Um, there's not a whole lot of info on it yet, just since yeah. they just kind of figured it out. I mean, microscale is still pretty new as well. Um, yeah. So it's it's kind of a test breeding yeah. um most of my pairings this year are test breedings i have a lot of stuff that has pos hats that i'm trying to prove out so it could be a really interesting year or it could be a really boring year those are like kind of the most exciting yeah that's you know the the head thing i i, I probably said this every show i i had uh two caramel miamis from silent hill gorgeous animals both of them had diffused het cinder het sun kissed right so triple head both children of hannibal i paired them together 14 perfect eggs all 14 eggs made it and i got 14 caramels one cinder one diffused and one honey <laughs> and it's like and a big middle finger yeah and a big middle finger and it's like <clears throat> that those heads sometimes you've got to play that genetic lottery time and time and time again i have and, three i have three from that Clutch yeah. now. I have I have a lot from yo, you have those from me. Yeah. Yeah. You have that cinder. My cinder caramel from JT is the coolest snake in the world to look at in person and the worst snake to take a picture of. Because every time I take a picture of her, I'm like, snake looks like a memory eye. I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and every time I show it to somebody, they're like, That's so badass. And it's like, I know. Those uh, caramel Miamis I have from you, dude. Like every they're shed, hot, they're just—they're hot. It's getting, yeah. They I get, help, they get I, better I and better back, and yeah. better. Ugh. I love Miami with other morphs: caramel Miami, uh, Annery Miami, uh, Sunkissed Miami. Mm -hmm. And you got some stuff from Eric. Uh, so the, his Sunkissed Miami stuff is just—it's mm -hmm. it's killer. Yeah, the mail that I've got from him is uh, Miami Het. Sun kissed caramel, uh, cinder, posset amel. Yeah. 
Uh, so he's great. Uh, he's probably the worst attitude on any corn snake I've ever owned, but <laughs> you know, funny. he's here for work, not, not for friendship. <laughs> right. so. that, that's the way I treat my males. I'm like, you might eat, you might be a dick. You might, you know what I mean? I don't You're here for a job, you. buddy. You got two months of work and you're just going back in the tub. I baby my females and then my yeah. males. I'm like, quit it. <laughs> yeah, I, I had two females this year. I was like, oh, you guys look like you didn't gain enough weight. I'm not going to broomate you. I'm going to feed you through the winter. I'm going to make sure you're perfect. You know, coming now, breeding season, I'm like, you girls are gorgeous, but we'll just wait till next next year. My males come out of brumation. I'm all, I don't even care if you eat. You breed and you shut your whore mouth. <laughs> Hey, it's most of the males come out of brumation and they don't care about anything but doing their job. Yeah, I think I have I have at least two males that have maybe had one or two meals since brumation. They come out, they got one thing they want to do, they don't care about eating and they get all skinny and lethargic looking and but they're they're spry when they see a female, you know. Uh-huh. And that's and it's that's part of the work we have to do, getting them into brumation. Once that kind of summertime hits, it's time to feed them. I fit them, hit them super heavy in summer. I don't feed real heavy in the winter, uh, regardless of what it is, uh, but I will feed consistently in the winter. But, man, that summertime, when they start getting that good appetite, eggs are in the incubator, nobody's breeding anymore, you know, two meals at a time, mm-hmm. meal every five days, get those males back up and, and work shape. And, and the males, God, they gain weight so fast. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. The females don't. It takes them a while. They gotta, you know, they they're doing a lot more. Well, you just had a baby. You know, there's a lot more <laughs> shit going on. I, I, you know, I had a baby. Well, I didn't. My wife did. But you know, I didn't didn't change at all. I was pretty much the same piece of shit I was before the baby was born. And, you know, my <laughs> wife goes through this entire gamut of not only physical distress but emotional distress. And I'm just like, I'll help her. I can. I don't know. I don't know even. I, I guess I'll do laundry and stuff. I don't know. You, you tell me. <laughs> Whatever you want. Whatever you want. And I'm here for it. Uh, but that's awesome. So I, I, I'm excited that you're doing a bunch of test breeding. That's, that's going to be fun. That mm-hmm. also means a big gamut of stuff you're going to put on the tables. Uh, you got any uh, specifically favorite kind of holdbacks from the last few years? Um, I have a one Okatee female um, that... She's the only one that I held back from this clutch. I bought a trio of Okatees. One of them was, uh, it was a pair of regular Okatees. Um, they're all uh, uh, hunt club locality Okatees. Okay. Um, kind of line bred to thicken their borders. Um, sure. And it was a pair of normal Okatees and then one Sunkissed. And then the two normals were Posset Sunkissed. Bred them together once. I sold the male before the eggs hatched because I'm stupid like that. <laughs> and the <laughs> eggs hatched time, yeah. and they, I had some visual Sunkissed. Um, and I only ended up holding back one female from the clutch just because she was a really nice, just plain Okatee. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the Sunkissed Okatee female that I bought in the trio was the one that I mentioned earlier that I could just never get to breed. Um but that female should probably breed next year, which I'm really excited about. Um, she's she's one of those really nice, deep orange, thick, black-bordered Okatees. Um, last year, I made a Hypo Sunkiss Tessera um, that I'm pretty excited about. And I also made some Hypo Amels, uh, okay. Motley and Motley Tessera. Uh, that are, I mean, they're bright. You see yeah. them in person and they're like neon. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't held back a ton the past couple of years. I, I get sale happy and then I get, oh, I don't need this snake. Oh, I'm tired of feeding this many snakes. Uh, you know, I need stuff to put on the table. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I do the whole, if it sells for this price, I'll sell it. If not, you know, I'll keep it. And then it sells for that price. So <laughs> I let it go. Um, but those are, those are probably two of my favorites. And then, um, my fluorescent reverse Okatees that I held back from last year, they're coloring up pretty nice. Um, That's awesome. so it'll be fun to see them, see them develop. Do you have a particular process when it comes to picking holdbacks? Like any given clutch, is there, do you have something in particular you look out for and or a certain ratio that you try to, you know, hold on to, or is it kind of just a clutch by clutch thing? If 
Um, it's kind of clutch by clutch. I, you know, I try to keep it logical. I'm not going to go and hold back like eight males and one female. Right. Um, I, I try to keep it logical, but, uh, if, if I have something that's a target for a pairing, I usually hold the targets back. Um, stuff that just has the most visual genetics. I try to hold the visuals back. Um, I, of course, I do part with some of the visuals because that's what people want to buy. They don't want to buy a normal that's het for five things. Right. They yeah. Buy right. A visual that's five things. Um, but uh, and every once in a while, I'll have one that somebody probably thinks is the ugliest snake in the world, but for whatever reason, I like it and I keep it. Do I need to hold back? You know, five normals? No. Do I find myself trying to hold back five normals? Sure. <laughs> yeah. But. I try to keep a basic rule of, you know, the stuff that has the most visual genetics, um, I'll go through and, you know, I'll pick kind of the nicer looking of all of it. If it's a, a new project and I'm getting just normals, um, I just kind of hold back a ratio, probably like two and two or a mm -hmm. two, three. I don't ever keep just one of a sex if it's a project I'm working on. Sure. Um, uh, never keep just one of a sex because something will always happen to it <laughs> every so single time if it's if it's like a project breeding and it's like a long-term something that i'm looking for i'll usually just pick like a, a two two or a two three that i just like the looks of um, i don't get super picky on it when it's like that do you as far as locality stuff do you have any interest in in that side of things is there anything you sort of mix into projects currently or is it um i don't i don't have a ton of locality specific stuff most of my uh what some people would consider localities like the okatees and the miamis right. um i don't have any specific like locality info on any of them um you know you have your like locality miami corn snakes and then you have your hobby spruced up to look pretty miamis which that's typically yeah. what i go for in the miamis the, the phenotypical um, miami and okatee and then the, yes. the actual true miami and okatee, yeah yes and then um as far as like actually keeping track of locality i don't have a lot of that um i do like to breed okatee into stuff just to get the thicker borders um mm -hmm. i just think it makes a really clean looking snake um it adds to the contrast and those things seem to sell pretty good at a show um, or even online, if people see that, that thick border and all that contrast on them, people seem to like that. That's a, it, it's, it, it's tough. And I, and I'd love to dip into the, the show thing here in a minute. The, the idea of holdbacks. So I, I don't vend a lot. Justin, I don't think has vended a show, uh, really selling, selling animals. Nope. Uh, so my, I've, I've sold I'm stuff to Billy and he sold it and he vended. So yeah. I vended technically the uh the idea of having a spread at a show having multiple phenotypes having multiple different types of look right and then kind of the salesmanship of it right mm -hmm. how many people are, are, are coming up to you that want to be breeders how many people are first time keepers you vend a lot of shows a lot of shows mm -hmm. uh how many do you think you do a year? Um, we try to do at least one a month. Uh, wow. Obviously, when I was pregnant, we took a break. And yeah, of course. And the baby yeah. was new, new, we took a break. But we try to do at least one a month. Um, coming up, I think, August, we have one every weekend. <laughs> oh, so wow. That's going to be tough. Um, and then there's sometimes where we just, we don't, have enough to justify buying a table uh, i don't want to drive all the way to a show if we only have like 10 things to put on a table right. yeah uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense financially for us um but yeah we try to we try to make at least one a month um because this is what i i do for work uh so my husband likes to see some sort of money come in from it and uh you know online sales are hit or miss um, it's a little harder to draw people in to buy stuff from you online than it is to stand in front of them at a table and put a snake in their hands and say, look how pretty this thing is. Would, yeah. Would she want to take it home with right. you? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. We, we stare, stare at them intensely and intimidate them into uh, 
Take buying it. it. Mm-hmm. Just gotta yeah. yell at him. Just, My shit. husband is definitely the salesman. You touch um, it, you buy it. Sales. Here, he worked in Hold sales it. for a few years, so he's uh, he's like pressure on. You want to take this thing home with you, kind of person. So he helps out a lot of the shows. Y'all have a really nice display too. Y'all, y'all have a clean. Everything looks good. You've got the nice, uh, nice aesthetic to what you're selling. So that was one of the first things I noticed when you were when we vented, we vented together. I was. Yeah. I don't even remember when that. Was. That was the last Corpus show you did, right? Yeah, that was February of last year. That sounds right. You got my boy Toad. How's he doing? Love oh, he's guy. good. He's he's a big spoiled baby. Um, bad. Yeah. Yeah, he is. He's uh, he's just normal Toad. We like Toad. Sweetheart. He's definitely one of the favorites. Right? I, I, and I told you when we were like playing with geckos, I was like, this one right here, he's the best. Yeah. he When we were doing like the kids' birthday parties and stuff, we would bring him along, and he was definitely a hit, especially when he would like jump from kid to kid. They loved that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you do some online sales as well. What would you say – maybe you prefer or which one is a little bit more successful compared comparatively shows or, or, or online shows 100% are more yeah. successful. Um, they're a lot more fun too. You actually get to go out there and network with the people and meet yeah. all these people face to face. You get to meet other breeders, you get to meet your customers. Um, and a lot of people, especially if they're just getting like a pet, it's one thing for a breeder to get like on morph market and look for something specific and mm-hmm. okay, well, I know that name. Um, I'm just going to, you know, I need those jeans. I'm going to buy that snake. But if somebody's just buying a pet, a lot of times they want to hold it. They want to play with it. They, they really want to shop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, we definitely have a lot more success with the shows. Sure. They're hit or miss. Sometimes we'll go and we make nothing. And sometimes we go and we, you know, even after expenses, we pocket over $1,500. Um, it, it, it just depends. Yeah. Um, but and then, like with corns too, you were talking earlier. You have one that sucks to photograph because it just looks like a mangy dog in a picture. Some just don't <laughs> photograph. Yeah, a lot of them are a lot easier to sell at shows because they can actually see that color. I work yeah. with a lot of like salmon snows and pink things. If you've ever tried to photograph a pink snake, you realize really fast that it looks white and yeah. pale and not pretty in a picture. So. uh those are a lot easier to sell in person because people can walk up to your table and be like, wow, pink. Yeah. So yeah, you, I like shows a lot more. Yeah. What do you find people ask for or, or end up buying the most out of what you typically bring like morph wise? Um, it's pretty so consistent. it shows you get. Elizabeth, I think your audio just dipped out, unless it was mine. Can you still hear me? I can hear you now. Was that me or was that you? I don't know. Sorry about that. I don't know. But uh, we get a lot of, like, kids at shows that want their first snake or their first pet. And all these kids come in with, like, their allowance money or their birthday money or their Christmas money. And, you know, their parents aren't giving them $300 to go and buy a snake. Their kids are get their parents are giving them maybe 100 maybe 50 maybe 75 um, so we sell a lot of like the lower end stuff, um, normal single gene morphs, like an annery, maybe a snow. Um, and we like to work with the kids too. If we have something that's like $150 and they only came with a hundred dollars and they absolutely yeah. fall with a snake, you can't, you can't tell a little kid. No, come on now. <laughs> yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's so funny you say that because I've sold more $75, $100 AML annery, AML annery tesseras than any other snake at a show mm-hmm. ever because that's kind of that perfect price range. Now that kid comes up and looks at that snake and you jump up. How are you? You know, you start doing the salesmanship thing. You don't have a net over your stuff and you're sitting grumpy as hell playing on your phone, mm-hmm. blaring stupid music like some people <laughs> like to do. Uh, you know, she knows. Yeah. We don't talk about Voldemort, but we all know. Uh, and and it's, <laughs> you have you have this whole – there's there's a connection that it immediately happens with that kid or that mom or that dad or that mm-hmm. aunt, uncle, grandma. And and they see it, you address them, they address you. Now it becomes a personal connection. Well, what do you what do you start showing them? Because they don't they don't see prices when they're walking by. They right. know they want a snake. Maybe they specifically know they want a corn snake. They they see small animals, they see small tubs. 
now that's kind of that first step. Now sell me this thing, right? Here, mm-hmm. here hold the pen and tell me, sell me this pen, right? Mm-hmm. And it's and, and 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 you know when I first met y'all, the aesthetic drew me to the table, and then that attitude, y'all y'all were both uh, very pleasant people to, to to just visit with me. I you know I was spending, so I just wanted to visit with everybody. Uh, mm-hmm. But y'all, y'all, I felt like y'all knocked that out of the park. And then, like you said, there, there's like a price point that shows. And, and does it does it pop you a bunch of money every time? No, but somewhere in that seventy five hundred dollar and like you said, sometimes hundred and fifty to hundred seventy five dollar range of course they they kind of fly off the table sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 not a bad place to be. One fun thing I found that I like doing at shows, and it actually works surprisingly well um i just go and get little paper bags and i'll pick corn snakes that are anywhere between like this 75 and 175 dollar range i'll put them in the bags and i'll label mystery corn snake and i'll just tell them (laughs) what sex the snake is and i'll line them up on the table and everybody stops to look at it and they're like "Hmm, hmm." and we sell a lot of them that way yeah there there was a yeah there was a vendor at the last show that was doing that and we both know him. He's, he's a good buddy of ours. Uh, and it had a little, he had little paper bags and it said mystery corn snake, 50 bucks, I think. Uh, and I can't tell you how many people I saw walk by. And I went up and asked him, I was like, dude, what do you, what do you put in there? And he's like, it's a mystery. You want to buy one? And I was like, uh-huh. holy shit, I do. I actually <laughs> buy one. Uh-huh. And then a, a girl walked by and I was like, you know what, what, what is it? What, you know, what's in there? And it was like a snow corn snake. And I was like, that's, it's a great deal, right? Like you, you got a good animal. It was a healthy animal. It was a well-known breeder. Like he breeds snakes, and that's mm-hmm. a you know, I it blew my mind. I, I was like, damn it, <laughs> I've got yeah. to try this. People are naturally curious, yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, they they want to know what it is. And it, it's a fun it's a fun gamble, a fun game to play, um, and we sell quite a bit like that. And it's a good way to sell the stuff that. Um, like a baby snow probably isn't the prettiest corn snake out there or you know like little miamis that just kind of look normal or little baby okatees they're ugly when they're babies yeah. um but you I mean i'm not saying i'm doing it to pawn off ugly snakes but they're no. the stuff that you know people look at on the table and they just look right past it because they're looking at ghosts or the, the salmon snow albino snow you know it's yeah that's that's really uh it's a great marketing technique. <laughs> I mean, like we've talked about it, you know, how fun would it be to just go and buy a pair of corn from like Petco or PetSmart and raise them up and then breed them and just see what comes out. You know, mm-hmm. I don't, there's just something about that sort of like not knowing what exactly is going on and it could turn into end up throwing something really cool or, you know, it could just be a nice clutch, like whatever. It's just, that's what makes corn so much fun. Yeah. They're, yeah. It's mm-hmm. a grab bag, and, and oh my god, it's a grab bag! Oh my, we did it, we did it, we came full circle. It's, it, uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm actually really excited that you told me that because it's like, I almost want to do it, but I'm not gonna do it if we're both bending doing the same thing. I'll just be like, well, maybe I'll do, I'll do like a mystery gecko thing, and I'll throw some, I'll have my brother throw some doo doo cresteds in there or something. That's then, actually no. where we, that's where we got the idea. We saw a guy at a show selling mystery crested geckos, and I'm like, huh, we should do this with snakes at our next show and. It, a, it works. A lot of arachnid people or an invert people actually do that. They'll do like a mm-hmm. mystery box where you, you know, for depending on the company, like Ken the Bug Guy used to do, you know, 150 bucks and you got like the box had more than basically the value was more than what you pay, but yeah. you don't know what you're going to get. And you just specify if it, you like you want old world stuff, new world stuff or a mix or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you had no idea what you were getting. And I did that, I think, once. And I got all kinds of weird stuff. I got this like absolutely psychotic Asian Kyler Brackey's tarantula and oh we all know what uh, that is some other like some scorpions like it wasn't even like an identified species of that tarantula they just knew what genus <laughs> it was in but it was fun like I, I love it that's really you know? cool that and you know you're probably like me if you put a fifty dollar price tag on it you're probably gonna put a seventy five or a hundred dollar snake in there you put mm-hmm. a thirty dollar price tag on it, it's gonna be a fifty or seventy five dollar snake it's not mm-hmm. you're not you you're you're never trying to screw people over, right? There's not right. like yeah. a, a yeah. there's not like a, a a kinked rat snake in there, right? It's, right. It's, it's always going to be something fun because you, but there's excitement in there. There's that seeing mm-hmm. that kid maybe you tear it open or that God, it should have been me, right? Like tear it open. Oh my God, what is it? You know, it's 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 adults tearing them open every time. One hundred percent, it's adults. 
It's the damn Pokemon cards. They got us. They done locked us in. They knew it. They knew it when they printed them. Magic the Gathering. Oh, Magic the Gathering did this to me. <sighs> that's probably Anyways, where it stems from. That's I probably, know, right? That's probably where it comes from. And you know, if you want to make it really interesting, throw an Aatrox in one of those bags. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how I'm getting rid of all my bull snakes this year. You're welcome. Yeah, a little black <laughs> pine in a bag. Like, just, Here you go, kid. It's just eating the tub like, from the inside somehow. It's the lament configuration from Hellraiser in a bag. It's a little black pine. It's going to consume your soul. That's so funny. And, you know, kids these days, uh, you know, my kid at least, she's, she's six, six and a half, are obsessed with these surprise toys, right? Yeah. They go to the store. They don't want the doll they can see. They want the doll they can't see because they want the excitement of possibly getting something that's uncommon or rare or whatever. And, and it's it, God, getting it's, the youth of America hooked on gambling before they're even of age. And I love gambling. Mm. I do. Uh, at uh, least you admit it. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it, okay, back on the corn sticks. We're talking about corn sticks. I, <laughs> I don't have an addiction. I'm just not quitting, right? Like, why would I quit when I'm ahead? I can stop whenever I want. Yeah. Uh, anyways, ba back to the kind of show to online sales uh, dichotomy. The show is also a really good place to to market and sell those more those lower end animals because how many people get on I say more excuse me morph market but your online posts or wherever you're posting Facebook Instagram and are going to actually buy like an AML or an AML mm -hmm. Tessera or an Annery or or something unless it has the genetics that specifically speak to their collection mm -hmm. uh, I I don't I don't think we find a lot of first time buyers on morph market I just don't think you do. Uh, no. I, I, even online, even the people following your page, the people that follow your page are probably uh, residual from seeing you at a show, uh, seeing your seeing your posts on the corn snake forums or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there is this inherent kind of really good thing about vending the show that says I can breed things that I like that maybe don't reach out to people online and maybe don't sell for a lot online, but I can also sell them at a show and, you know, it pocket a lot more money than you're going to do wholesale. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. wholesale corn snakes, I think right now is 10 or 15 bucks. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we all, we've all wholesaled at some point, right? Like it's, it's something that comes up. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta feed a baby, right? Like that's, it's, it's, it's gotta happen. You gotta pay mortgage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or even, uh, I, uh, need to not buy that many pinkies next month. <laughs> that's yeah. Yeah, it's a thing that snake costs four or five dollars a month to feed plus your time to clean it plus your time to give it clean water two or three times or maybe two times a week once a week uh, your time to feed it your time to make sure the sheds out your time to make sure it ate that pinky and then your time to stress out when it didn't eat the pinky mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm sitting here nodding my head going yeah when it's like I haven't had to buy frozen mice in a long time but you have I'm like yeah you're absolutely no. right and it's like I can go over and get whatever I need right now well, some and of us aren't allergic to anything. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, well, awesome. Uh, I, I'd love to kind of deviate from this conversation and, and talk a little bit about your current partnership with uh, Wire Forest Reptiles. Yeah. Uh, that's huge. Yeah, so we're pretty excited about that. All of that stemmed from my desire to get one single snake. Um, I have a couple of females. Uh, at the time, I had three females, but I sold one of them. So now I just have two that have a bunch of genetics and I have no males that match all of those genetics. And I looked for months here in the U.S. and could not find anybody with males. I messaged Steve Roylance. I messaged a whole bunch of people asking them, you know, do you have projects that's going to make this snake? And everybody said no. Oh, real quick, what were the genetics? Um, Sunkissed, Caramel, Amyl, Lavender, Hypo. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, so uh, Ian actually commented on one of my Facebook posts, and he's like, hey, I have this mail. And I'm like, haha, that's funny, you're over in the UK. And most of our hog noses that we have now came from an import shipment from Germany, so we know how expensive it is to import snakes. Very um, expensive. And I was like, I, I can't pay $1,500 to ship a single snake across the pond. I'm sorry, it's not happening. And I kind of mentioned it in passing to my husband and he was like, well, you know, I got my hog noses from over in Europe. It's only fair that you should get an import ship of corn snakes. And I'm like, hey, I like you. <laughs> and uh, 
he let me go ahead and do it. And so Ian and I sat up for hours messaging each other while I'm trying to pick stuff off of his off of his website to make a shipment to justify importing these snakes. Um, and he was really, really good. He was excellent. He's probably one of the nicest breeders I have ever worked with. And he ran all around his facility, bless his heart, trying to find all of these really specific genetics that I wanted. And he was even pulling stuff out of his whole back rack to send to me just to fill in some gaps that I needed filled in. And we ended up getting 30, 33, I think, snakes from him. Nice. Um, and to do all of this, I actually went and got my importer's license um, because it was just cheaper and easier than going through somebody else in wherever in the country and having them yeah them. middleman yeah this way they could just get sent straight to me um and it wasn't super expensive to get the import license it was kind of a headache dealing with fish and wildlife but it is what it is yeah what's i mean um, what's the process there because i've you know i think myself and billy hunt have, have talked about looking into it just for the sake of you know if we want more chondros or things like that you know being mm -hmm. able to just get them ourselves and not have to deal with another party and but I, I think I looked into it at one point. It didn't look like it was super difficult, but it definitely seemed like there was sort of a lot of hoops you had to jump through. Mm -hmm. So first you have to apply to have an online account. And then once you get approved to have an online account, then you have to go into that account and apply for your permits or licenses, whatever you want to do. They have a whole bunch. This is through Fish and Wildlife, by the way, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, they have a whole bunch of different things that you could do. Um, obviously, I applied for the importer exporter license. Um, and once I got the application in with all of my like tax ID number and everything like that, it really did not take them very long to get back to me. Probably within a week, I had my license. Oh, wow. Um, then the real headache started when every year filing all the paperwork to actually import something into the country. And of course, I'd never done it before. So I had about a million and one questions. And the agent that I had local to me was no help at all because she did not know how to answer her phone or her email. Um, and then when I finally got her on the phone, she had the worst attitude with me. Like I was just the most annoying toddler that had asked her why 800 times in a row. Um, God forbid and, you have to do a job. I know. And uh, I actually, when the snakes came in, I didn't even have to deal with her in person. Fish and Wildlife did absolutely nothing with the shipment. U.S. Customs did all my paperwork and scanned it all into the system. They didn't even look at the snakes. They just did my paperwork and stamped everything and said, okay, you're good to go. Go pick them up. Um, but kind of backtracking a little bit, you get your license and then you have to kind of coordinate everything with the exporter over on the other side. Um, and the guy that Ian works with, his name is Phil, and he's super, super great, super helpful, um, very nice. And it was a pretty smooth process. Um, we coordinated everything. He got them on a flight with American Airlines, a cargo flight. And they went from somewhere in England, I think, to Dallas and then caught a connecting flight down here to Houston. And uh, I was able to like track the flight on my phone. And once they came in, they went to like the cargo bay at the airport. Um, and I had to go pick them up from the airport. And uh, it was, it took me maybe an hour total to get everything picked up at the airport. Um, and then uh, it wasn't bad at all. Uh, the process, it, Probably the worst part of it was the one employee that was not helpful at all and didn't want yeah. to uh, communicate or anything. But uh, once I kind of figured out what I was doing, it was pretty easy. And I'm pretty confident going forward that it, I'm not going to have any issues because mm -hmm. I know how to do it now. So, so one, that's a great example of a, an employee in a, in a important position that can really fuck something up. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the overall and I've kind of always wondered this how long do the animals spend in a box right what is the actual do you kind of have a ballpark of how long the snakes were in the box um so I think Ian texted me maybe I think I got a message from him on Sunday night which at that point may have been Monday morning for him yeah. Um, but my Sunday night, um, he messaged me and said, they're packed up, they're ready to go. 
at that point, he shipped them to Philip, who got everything situated. I don't know if they switched boxes at that point. I'm willing to bet they probably switched from Ian's box to the big box that they came to me in. And then they touched down here probably about 10 o'clock Wednesday morning. So three days, give or take. Yeah. That's not bad. It's mm. not, not bad at all. I mean, an animal um, will spend that much time in a tub at a show every yeah. weekend. You know I mean? mm-hmm. And so I I was a nervous wreck the entire time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, that's, it's a lot of money. But uh, everything made it fine. Um, and I couldn't be happier with the quality of stuff that I got from him. His stuff's awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, some of the best. Animals. Just, yeah. And uh, so- he was he was very, very good through the whole process. We actually bought the snakes from him in October and weren't able to get them here until a March or April. So he, he wow. kept them for us for a while. Um, but yeah, it was it was very easy and seamless working with Ian. So now when it comes to importing, are you planning on doing any exporting? Um, I'm able to with my licenses and everything and people have asked him and he has in turn asked me if that would be a thing. Um, and we have actually had friends here in the U S reach out to us about exporting too. um, a lot of hog nose breeders have reached out to us. Yeah. Hog nose um, breeders go like worldwide with everything they do. I've kind of noticed hog noses are insane. <laughs> But um, I can export as far as um, if I'm comfortable to do it. Uh, that would take a couple of sleeps and a lot of thinking and mm-hmm. figuring out how I would go about that. Um, I can't imagine it's much different than importing, just kind of everything's flipped around. Right. Um, but technically, yes, I can export. It's just at my discretion and if I want to do that. Yeah. Now you can help organize importing though from Mm -hmm. from the uk yes so our partnership um pretty much anybody here in the u.s that buys from ian their snakes are going to come to me and i will put them in a fedex box and send it to them Um, that's basically the extent of our partnership we're not doing any like breeding partnerships or anything like that yet we might get to that point but um as far as what we're at now um because he's had a lot of U.S. people interested in stuff that he has. Oh, I'm um, sure. Of course, yeah. Just yeah. not an open and ready avenue to get them here. Um, and I kind of take the guesswork out of the equation. Because, like, when I went to I import, okay, well, how does it work? What do I need to do? Who are they going to go to? Well, crap, I'll just get them to come to me. I'll just yeah. jump right. through all the hoops and do it myself. Um, and now... Uh, all of that went so well between him and I and Philip as well um, that we just kind of figured, hey, why don't we keep it this way? And now, sure. you know, when I have people in the U.S. that want to buy something and they have all these questions about how to get it there and I can't answer, I can just say, you know, you know there's a person in the U.S. that I will send them to and she will send them to you and we're done. Yeah. That's a... Uh... That's pretty amazing, honestly. That's a that's a huge undertaking, and, and it sounds like you not only covered all your bases, but you mm-hmm. generated a great partnership. That's really awesome. We're very excited about it. I'm super happy to work with Ian. I've followed him for a couple of years now, and I've, oh yeah, it's amazing stuff. Yes, I've looked up to him in his collection for a while now. So is, is the plan? It, oh, go ahead, Justin. Is it going to be one of those things where, so like when if you sent to Canada, I think they have two two days out of the year where they do import export into Canada. So Mm -hmm. basically like you time it to that, your stuff is getting to the people taking it, you know, holding it to go over the border. All that arrives at the same time in the same like two day frame before it goes. So is it going to be one of those things where you have like people are going to buy and then everything that has been bought in a given time frame is what gets sent over? Um, So we could, Technically, we could do it as people buy it. We could send it. So, like, if somebody buys 
now and then two weeks from now somebody else buys uh we could send it separate but i think what we're going to try and aim for is to at least fill a box right. um which will hold a lot of snakes because i got 31 babies and two adults and had so much room in the box still mm -hmm. like a lot of room um i think we're gonna aim for trying to fill a box be it from a single customer or from 15 different customers um that way i'm not having to go to the airport as many times right. uh, ian's not having to ship as many times um, just to kind of lessen the workload on everybody um so kind of yeah we'll kind of do along in that um not that we have to but more so that it it's easier on everybody mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a lot. With the kind of a question generating in my mind, what does the fish and wildlife paperwork have to look like coming in? Does every snake have to be labeled? Does you know is there is there is there anything to that? Am I just saying this out loud? And could just be a box of snakes, or, or there's got to be something, right? Um. So they want to know what like how many of each species of snake are in the box. Um, and depending on what kind of snake it is, there's different things that go into it. Like there's certain species that are endangered or protected or whatever that you have extra, have to have extra permits for. Um, native wildlife, you have to have extra permits for. Like if I was to import a bunch of transpacific rat snakes, I'd probably have to have different permits for them or import okay. Western hog noses. I'd probably have to have different permits for them because they're native to Texas. Um, yeah. And that would kind of fall into Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, but as far as U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they just needed to know how many of each species that I had in the box. And then um, they had to know the value of what was in the box. Okay. Um, so I just pulled an in our, our invoice from Ian and copied that price over. And then I got into an argument with the Fish and Wildlife lady <laughs> because uh, currency exchange, it it changes every day it fluctuates every day yeah and the day that i like filed the paperwork it was different than the day that she went and looked at it and she's like this price isn't correct um and i'm like i i don't know what to tell you <laughs> i don't know what to tell you that's you know there's a time difference between when you buy something and when it's actually arrives here mm -hmm. uh, so what about uh you know this is again kind of another question while we're looking at this what what about other animals from europe maybe i'm interested in buying maybe some of these great looking leonis locality animals they have over there what, could i have them shipped to him and then in turn worked through you or is that not something y'all are really looking at just yet um we honestly haven't talked about that the extent of really the extent that, that of would be like large scale importing like yes. yeah we're dealing with multiple okay yeah and the, it's kind of just a good question i guess now you it doesn't necessarily have to come through him anybody that can export out of europe can send to me um, oh, okay. so if i mean anybody that finds something in europe that they want over here i would just have to work it out between their exporter and talk with their exporter but uh like say you found somebody in germany that bred something really cool and you want it you could reach out to me and say hey i'm looking to get this stuff imported this is their exporters info can you work it out with them and see if you can get it here. And then it would come to me and I would, like I said, put it in the normal, you know, reptiles to you box or whatever and send it yeah. to you just like I was sending it from myself. Wow. Okay. That's awesome. Got 10 monocle cobras. You got me. <laughs> I'm just thinking about a lot of the king snakes that made it over to Germany that are being bred over in Europe for many, many years that never made it to America. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just, you know, a little, little heartfelt, just question, you know, let's see the, because that's that's always been on my mind. A lot of people won't export certain things out of Europe, mm -hmm. and there's honestly, when you look at the legality of it, there's no reason why not, right? Like if it's legal there, and it's legal here, there's no reason we can't transport it from there to here. The question is, how did it get there? But they don't care how it got there, and we do care how it got here. But as long as you have transport from there to here, I'm saying this, you know, hypothetically, right? But that's a so is that is that is that a path you want to as things go go down or is that not really you're kind of just trying to uh 
facilitate specifically animals from him to 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 America? Um, I mean, I would be open to it. Uh, we've had some other friends reach out to us. Uh, my husband has a really good friend that breeds hog noses. He's reached out to us and said, "Hey, uh, you know, I might get with you because I've got some stuff that you know I want that's over there, and it it's a little more comforting if somebody that you know is." handling your animals versus Absolutely. like yeah. when we got our hog noses imported, they came in through uh, snakes at sunset in Florida. And I mean, I've heard of the company, but I don't personally know the person Yeah, and it's, it's a lot of money. You, once you get it, once it's all said and done, you have a lot of money wrapped up into it. We probably had easily over $12,000 wrapped up in the shipment. Yeah. Um, wow. Once it's all said and done. And a lot of people just don't, want all of that money going to just anybody that they don't know from Adam. Um, so I would definitely be open to, you know, helping friends out, um, getting, if y'all lose me, I'm sorry. The Wi-Fi just cut out on our TV and you're, I, don't, you're good. I hope you're it doesn't no, cut out right here. Um, but uh, I would definitely be opening to, you know, helping friends out. We're not going to like open it to the public and be like, Hey, everybody in the U S if you sure. want snakes yeah. from Europe, let me know. Um, but you know, personal colleagues and friends and people that we've worked with in the past, I would definitely be open to, you know, helping them out and helping them get their stuff over here. So for a general idea for our audience, uh, let's say we're wanting to buy five, 10 snakes. Cause I'm assuming you want to probably make it a decent sized box. You don't want to buy one snake. Yeah. What, what is a, do you, do you kind of have an idea on what a ballpark range is to import that box? You know, we, we know that it's going to be somewhere between 55 to about $70 once it hits here for you to get it out the door. Plus, there needs to be some level of a fee on your side. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, there's got to be you, – you've got to you got to get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and you deserve it with the work you've put in. What would we say that ballpark range is to get that box here to America? So basic rundown on – I'll just give you a rundown on what it cost us just okay. because I know that. Um, after we paid for our animals to Ian, um, we had to pay him to ship the animals from himself to his exporter. And then we had to pay the exporter to send them from him to the U S. Okay. Um, we paid a, f it was 1500 pounds, which transferred into about $1,800 flat rate for the box that those animals came in. And the way he explained it to me, that's the flat rate, whether you get one snake or you fill that box up. Okay. Um, $1,500, which is why I'm saying if you're going to import, you make it worth yes. the yes. while. Yeah, absolutely. Don't, don't pay $1,500 of import fees for one snake unless you just really, really want that snake. Yeah. Um, and then once they got here, I had to pay... $180 to Fish and Wildlife for an inspection fee, even though they did not inspect the snakes. They still want an inspection fee. Um, and then I had to pay $100 to the airline for uh, like a handling fee, like sure. shipping and handling for a project. So just shipping alone, not counting costs of the actual snakes. Um, it was probably about $90 to Ian for him to ship to Philip about $1,800 to ship from Europe to us. And then an extra almost $300 okay. for like fish and wildlife fee and airport fee. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, probably pushing, I don't know, somebody else did the math. <laughs> About 2,300 bucks. Let's yeah. go, let's go 2,250. Maybe let's, 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 let's say 2,300 ballpark. And, and I want everybody that's listening to understand that's that number may feel inherently like a high number. The animals you're getting besides that, regardless, that's not that high of a number. That's less money than it's going to cost you for a round flight trip to Europe. First and foremost, it's about, about 12 to $1,500 to get there, about 12 to $1,500 to get back. Uh, and, and I work in a company that, uh, imports uh, flies in material from all over the world, and I've paid eighty-seven thousand dollars to have a piece of pipe brought in from France. Uh, oh my so, goodness! So, uh, Inconel four hundred. If anybody knows what it is, custom-made pipe. Uh, but that's not bad. I thought it was going to be a lot more than that. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, now whenever it goes through somebody else, you know, you obviously are going to have to pay the shipping from them to you within the U.S. Um, and then uh, you'll have to cover like the import fees and stuff like sure. that. And then you'll have to pay uh, for that person's time. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, they'll charge per snake, which is what we're going to do. We're going to charge charge per snake. Um, As you should. Yes. And I think the way we're going to do it is uh, they're going to pay pretty much everything to Ian except for FedEx shipping. They'll pay that straight to me. Um, they'll pay everything to Ian just as one payment. That way they're not having to pay this person, pay this person, pay this person. Yeah. Um, and then Ian will kind of delve out the money where it needs to go. Yeah. Um, he'll send the $1,500 to fill up and then he'll send my cut to me. I think we're going to end up doing like 15 or $20 per snake, which some people have told us that that's really cheap. It's really cheap. Uh, <laughs> I, I haven't done a whole lot of, you know, paying other people to import animals for us. So I don't know a good going rate, but yeah. 60% Ian, and I, markup. Ian and I talked and we kind of settled on 15 to 20. I think we're going to do like $20 per snake. If you get less than X amount of snakes. And then yeah. if you get more than that, we'll bump it down to like 15 per snake. So, so you're talking about getting a group of four or five people together and then paying somewhere around five or $600 each to bring in something that I'm going to assume is a decent amount of animals. Mm -hmm. uh, that's shockingly affordable. That's a lot mm -hmm. less than I thought it was going to be uh, from some of the horror stories I've heard about importing. Uh, so that's, that's, that's really exciting. That's awesome that you're doing that. We're very excited to kind of get the ball rolling and starting on it. Ian is very excited. <laughs> it, it, I'm you know, sure it, he gets all kinds of messages from people, you know, from the U.S. saying, "How do I get your stuff?" And then, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I'm I'm sure he was in between a rock and a hard place for a while, but I'm very happy to have opened an avenue for him, and I'm very excited to work with him in the future. I I hope for you that this also mm -hmm. uh, at some point relates itself back to shipping back to him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you start looking at some of the animals that people like JT, who you know, which is Walter Smith. Uh, derivative to some extent uh carol huddleson uh mm -hmm. you know uh your your, your red zap line stuff you know there's uh -huh. stuff that we have here that they don't have over there that i've been messaged before by people from from other countries uh you know i, I in the gecko trade this is a little bit more palatable uh we see lychees and, and gargoyle geckos uh that i don't know why Maybe it's the fact that the animals are fifteen hundred, two thousand, five thousand dollars. Sometimes they get exported constantly to other places. Uh, I, I've sold so many geckos that went to Korea for some reason, and, mm -hmm. and it just is what it is. And it's you know I always ship them to an exporter, and I never hear a word back from them. And then like a week later, I, I get an odd message at like two a.m. Uh, you know that's from Google Translator that's saying, "Hey, geckos here, it's perfect." And uh, but that's exciting to, ha to have, a, have a direct stream, especially in the corn snake world, mm -hmm. uh, where this fluidity and clubridge really isn't something that we talk about too much. And we should, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, we, we, we know uh, uh, Cascade Corns, uh, Jeff Bong, uh, good friend of all of ours. And, and he's imported some stuff from Europe. And, you know, he's talked to me about the troubles and the kind of tribulations he's gone through. And, and now it's kind of neat to see somebody that's a, a real human and, <laughs> and, you know, talk to you about what it, it, it's a lot. That's a lot of work that you, you, you did. You did. You, you've done awesome. And, you, and you've made it sound shockingly simple, which I know it's not. <laughs> uh, I think it'll be a lot easier once I do it again. Now that mm -hmm. I kind of have a bunch of the wrinkles ironed out. And then of course, like everything that you do, it gets a little more easy every time you do it, but I'm really excited. Hopefully it opens up some avenues for, you know, not only Ian, but for me as well. Um, I would love to be able to network with some of these breeders that I haven't had a chance to network with before. Some of these big top dogs in the corn snake industry, some of the first names that come to mind whenever you think corn snake breeders. Um, I would absolutely love to work with some of these people. Well, girl, you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm it's getting you. there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying very hard. You're young, you're smart, you're doing it right. You've got a great collection. You got a diversified genetics, just based off stuff you're importing and based off stuff you're working with. You're 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 on the, you're on the right path. And I and I and I you know I met you in person, so I know that this isn't a fake attitude. You, you you've got a you know, glowing attitude. So does your husband. 
uh, you're, you're doing things the right way. And that's, that's what's important. That's what's important in this hobby. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. So in all of this, where, where, you know, maybe part of exporting, importing, or, or just where, what you see now, where do you, where do you kind of see the corn snake hobby going? Um, I don't see it slowing down by any means. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's definitely taking off, especially if we start doing a whole bunch more, you know, work in between Europe and stuff like that, that could open a lot of, uh, a lot of doors. Um, like, just Ian, for example, he has so much stuff that has like eight genes in one snake and it blows me away. Um, and there's, there's so many combos out there that haven't been done yet just because there's so much, uh, there's so many morphs, um, so many yeah. different combinations that you can do so many combinations that haven't been done. Um, will it ever be on ball Python level? Uh, probably not because ball pythons are pretty, pretty ridiculous ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um i definitely see it you know steadily climbing um popularity of corn snakes i don't see that going anywhere they're great for first time pets um they come in so many different vibrant colors um and like i said there's so much that hasn't been done yet there's stuff that's still being discovered like microscale popped up all of a sudden a couple of years ago um we're just figuring out that uh, or micro scale popped up. We're just figuring out that micro scale and scaleless work together. Um, so, so is it kind of? I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to derail for one second. Mm -hmm. Does it work along the lines of like Motley and Stripe, where one is more dominant when they're on the same locus, or is it just allelic to each other? Um, as of now, they're allelic to each other. That's one of the things. Don't really know. There hasn't been much test breeding because they just discovered last year that they're allelic to each other. Um, that you can breed a scaleless and a micro scale and they will make micro scaleless just hmm. first generation. You don't have to breed, you know, get the babies that are het scaleless and het micro scale and yeah. breed them back together. You know, you, you get it first generation. Um, so that's, I've asked Ian a bunch of questions on the topic and he just does not know how to answer them <laughs> uh, because it, it hasn't been figured out yet. Um, so hopefully we'll have some answers after this year between myself and Ian and anybody else that may be working with uh, Microscale, Scaleless, Microscaleless. That's that's pretty awesome. Any morphs, other, other morphs kind of outside of that, uh, kind of the more typical corn snake pilot that you think are, are kind of exploding or planning on thinking that that's going to be the next big thing or maybe it's already becoming the big thing? Um. Palmetto, a lot of people are doing a whole bunch of different palmetto morphs, um, like your caramel palmetto, uh, which is an absolutely stunning snake in my opinion. Um, Annery palmetto, amyl palmetto, hypo palmetto. I could go on forever. Um, of course, there's there's some variants that like a blizzard palmetto, you're probably not gonna be able to see much on that because that's yeah. white spots on a white snake. How are you gonna tell what it is? But uh, palmetto variants have definitely started becoming more popular. Um, anything that really catches the viewer's eye when you post pictures of it. I know those red zeppelin Okatees. Holy crap. They're those awesome. are insane. And I don't know why I don't have any in my collection yet because they are insane. Um, but bright, vibrant, cool stuff like that that catches the eye. Um, it really draws a bunch of people in and it really draws a bunch of people to say, oh, I want that. I want to make that. I want that in my collection. Um, and then you have just the, the, the more basic things. That's just a clean snake, like a clean Okatee, a clean yeah. Miami, a clean blood red. Um, and then pied stuff, uh, pied stuff's pretty popular and they're line breeding pieds to make really high pied snakes, um, with like rings around their necks. I think they call them ringers. Yeah. Um, insane. I've seen those. Those are crazy insane absolutely stunning um and now that we've kind of discovered the we know pied is only in diffuse but now they've kind of realized that pied is also a het gene that is only visible when they are diffused mm -hmm. or at least that's the i believe the understanding of it now and these genetics are a difficult complex thing and listen to the travis wyman episode we had it's not always that easy 
Yeah. Uh, but now that they're kind of realizing that, you know, I I have a pied female. I have bred her to a het diffuse male. I have made blood reds, tessera blood reds, pewters, and tessera pewters, but I have never gotten a, a pied, right? And I'm wondering, you know, why, why not, why not? Well, oh, wait, it kind of makes sense. He doesn't have the pied gene that is visible through. So that's kind of, you know, man, our understanding of this, something that's been going on for 50 years is still compounding on itself, yep. which is excites the hell out of me, right? Like it's, it's something that we all thought was so easy. Don't worry about corn sticks. That's easy. There's uh-huh. 32 more, right? Or 33 more. Nah. Yeah. Nah. And it's like, no, we've, we're really, and then, and then the line breeding aspect of it. Now we're mm-hmm. starting to line breed specific morphs to have specific looks to have, you know, to, getting rid of deleterious genes, right? We're line breeding things to not have those, you know, lavender, don't breed lavender, don't breed lavender to lavender. They're all coming out kink. And then, well, maybe we start breeding that out. And now we're kind of looking at it and saying, wait, I had a whole clutch of lavenders that came out perfect. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe this was one of the deleterious genes. Sunkiss for years, right? 70s, 80s. I believe Sunkiss was found in the late 70s, maybe early 80s for years. You don't breed Sunkiss, right? Sunkiss are all swimmers. They all have that kind of stargazing thing going on. Kathy Love, sweetheart, goes above and beyond to breed that out of them Mm -hmm. and says, well, genetics are more complex than just simple recessive, right? There's other things involved. We're looking at multiple genes. You can actually breed that out. That was a recessive trait. And and, and wow, where where are we at now? We breed sun kiss into everything and have no (laughs) issues at all, right? I I haven't heard of a sun gazer sun kissed in 20 years, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? 15 years. So... It's Interesting a, caveat on that. Ian actually uh, tests all of his sun kissed stuff to make sure it's sun gazer free, stargazer free. Right, stargazer, you're right. Sorry, excuse me. Mm. That's awesome. That's a, that's a good breeder. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? There's, there's uh, you know, uh, many years ago, I remember uh, Chris Montross was talking about uh, his water snakes and seeing how well they swim when they're babies. And I was like, you know, I saw it. I was like, why? Why is that? And he's like, well, what if you get a snake that can't swim? I was like, shit, what if you have a snake that can't swim? And it's just it's just one of those things that kind of resonated with me. And it's like producing healthy snakes, promoting healthy snakes, selling healthy snakes. Wow. Doing that as a breeder. And then somebody that's at your scale, 200 snakes, you know, a potential in the future, producing a thousand snakes. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Taking that care. Somebody like Ian taking those steps, taking that care. Giving, giving that true, honest opinion of what they're caring about, what they're selling, uh, you know, slowly weeds out the Voldemorts. You know what I mean? They, mm-hmm. they, they eventually disappear because their prices aren't better because they're buying from us and their attitude isn't better because they're standing next to us. And, you know, what, what, why would you go to them? And mm-hmm. it, slowly but surely, it takes that time. We have to weed those people out. And, they, and those, those, the brightest flames burn out first. And we, we've seen mm-hmm. that. Uh, but no, that's, that's a, that's a good point. That's really, I didn't know, I didn't know he did that. And that's, that's a, that's, that's cool that that's, a, that's a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there any, you know, you've been talking about palmettos. Is there anything that you're taking care of in your, uh, collection to make sure you're outcrossing? Um, so I don't have a ton of palmetto stuff. Um, I have one pair that are, I mean, they're babies still. I have a baby pair that are visual palmetto and then our, female she's a normal het palmetto a bunch of other stuff that came from ian and then we have a male that we're borrowing from a friend to breed to her and i think he was produced by he may have been produced by travis okay travis one yeah or Tra- um, travis whistler sorry yeah travis whistler um but we're not too far into the palmettos yet that we're you know going real heavy in them and you know taking care of all that stuff but you know once we uh get into them and we start breeding them a little more yeah we're gonna be um we're gonna be pretty uh pretty strict on how we're breeding them and you know if we're getting offspring from pairs that are just not great or they're bug eyes or you know, stuff like that, stuff that, you know, they're smaller snakes, they're weaker snakes, so we're probably not going to breed that pair together again. Nice. Um, and, and you have Splendida to handle that problem for you. Mm-hmm, exactly. We'll eat literally anything. 
<laughs> Anything. Yes. So that, that kind of hits on one of those final questions we kind of ask everybody. Uh, so where do you see or, or think about Palmettos and where do you see or think about Scalas? Um, yeah, I know there's a lot of uh, controversy on both of them. Um, you see bug eyes in, in a lot of leucistic things. Yeah. Um, and they're not going anywhere. Palmettos are not going to leave the hobby. Scaleless is not going to leave the hobby no. because it's cool. Um, oh, well, scaleless are hybrids. Okay. But look at how many pure corns we're breeding them to. Um, at some point, the percentage of hybrid that's in them gets so low that most people don't even call it a hybrid. I personally work with creamsicles a lot, which is a, mm -hmm. a great plains rat corn snake hybrid. Um, and most people sell creamsicles as corns. And you have yeah. those people out there that, you know, creamsicles are technically hybrids. And whenever I'm selling creamsicles, I will tell people these are technically hybrids. Um, but once they're bred in the hobby for so long, they're bred back to, you know, true corns. And yeah. it all, it, it kind of severely dilutes whatever other snake is bred in mm -hmm. there. Um, I personally don't have a problem with palmettos or scaleless. Um, you know, if you're being responsible with it, like don't go around breeding bug-eyed palmettos. Mm. Um, probably don't do that. Of course, yeah. Bad, <laughs> Bad every time. Um, but, uh, and scaleless, I mean, I haven't noticed as far as like quality of life on scaleless. A lot of people are like, oh, oh my goodness, that's cruel. They don't have scales. They're no different than my normal horns. Um, I mean, my normal corns, I have more issues here and there with them shedding than I do with any of my scaleless corns. I don't keep them any different. They're on the same bedding. They have the same water bowls. They eat the same food. Uh, but they're not They're not really different than all the other corn snakes that I have. Um, yeah. And like I said, they're not going anywhere. They're popular. They're cool. They're cutting edge. Um, we're just getting started with them. We're starting to breed different colors into them, different color combinations. And I mean, who can say that, you know, certain scaleless morphs aren't pretty like a scaleless anery. Oh my goodness. They're pretty. Scaleless anery are stunning. There's, yes. And I'm not a scaleless guy. And I think the thing that people have about scaleless is my, my snake's supposed to have scales and it's, you know, mm -hmm. that whole same you know they took our jobs it's always the same guy yeah <laughs> uh, I, it's I'm me not, i'm that i'm that guy <laughs> that, i'm not a big fan of the scaleless to me it's an aesthetics thing but that's just mm -hmm. and it, not that i have a problem with scaleless and i've said this a million times uh they're beautiful but it's just maybe that's not for me but there's mm -hmm. a lot of morphs that are not for me there's there's plenty yeah. of things that i just that just don't resonate in my my little tiny pea brain uh, but God, a scaleless Andrea are amazing. Mm -hmm. See, God, I, they're amazing. I absolutely hated scaleless when they first started coming around. I hated it. I despised it. I was like, that is so bizarre. Why would you want a scaleless snake? And then, yeah. you know, I held one for the first time and a whole lot of jokes were made about how that snake feels. And if you've ever held a scaleless snake, you know what they're, I'm talking about. They're slightly <laughs> phallic. There's, there's uh, a phallic yep. element to them. Yeah. And so uh, one of my good friends, he has one that he brings to expos and its name is Willie. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it they grew on me and some some could say that you have to follow the market when you're breeding. And in some terms, you, you kind of do. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to sit here and breed normals over and over and over and over again there's only so far that i'm going to make it in the hobby sure um, and i just i don't know i kind of grew to like scaleless i looked at them and like i said scaleless anneries they're gorgeous the contrast that scaleless gives um but again scaleless is technically a hybrid and that's not for everybody there's a lot of people that don't like scaleless just because it's a hybrid um way on down the line uh but, I mean, to each their own. I understand that there's a lot of breeders out there that don't like the scaleless, and that is great. That's awesome. Um, we need diversity. We need yeah. we need different people doing different things. If everybody bred scaleless, scaleless would be worth $20 a piece. Yeah. Um, 
you know, everybody needs to do what they like to do. And I've learned this earlier in my career or my time doing this, that you can't do what everybody else wants to do. You have to do what you want to do because you're going to get burnt out really fast if you're doing what everybody else wants. If you're breeding to, to set a market, if you're breeding to do what's a new hot thing, if you're breeding to do the thing that's popular at your shows, you're going to burn out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fast. You're absolutely mm-hmm. right. Yep, there's been some projects that I started because I was like, wow, everybody likes this. I wanted to work with it. But I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Like, Pied stuff. I think Pied's pretty. I don't have any desire to work with Pied's. I kind of delved into it a little bit a couple of years ago because I was like, well, this is what people want. These are cool snakes. These get a lot of attention. Um, I worked with them for maybe a year, and I was like, I really don't like this. I wasn't looking forward to pairing them. I wasn't looking forward to the eggs hatching. I wasn't looking forward to taking them out and taking pictures of them. It just wasn't exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And then you don't, I mean, you pick a job that you love. You don't ever work a day in your life. And, you know, there's, you've got to do what you like. At the end of the day, you've got to do what you like. And you can't do what everybody else wants you to do. Yeah. It's definitely uh, like we were having a conversation about Tessera in the the Corn Stars group chat thing, and you know I love Tessera. That's always been one of my favorite favorite sort of mutations. Um, I definitely understand. The more I have it, you know, the more I get why people may not be into it. Um, and I've actually come to find that I I think I like it more in moderation than anything else. Like mm-hmm. I like it, I just don't want it in everything. Right. Um, you know, I guess mask falls into that that category too, um, uh-huh. and it's just that that fact of you can't get that genie back in the bottle. You know, mm-hmm. like once it's there, it's there. You know, it's not it's not going anywhere. Um, Starts popping up on everything. <laughs> right, right, and <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, it's it's definitely with corns in particular. You know, finding that that morph or a couple of morphs that you're you're really really into and and just you know, pursuing those and seeing what happens and tying it into other stuff. And Chris hates, uh, hates Castagna and hates Tessera. So I love Tessera. I was just it saying, is- we were talking earlier about how, you know, I, my, my views on it have come to change over time. Like I love Tessera, but it's definitely something I've come to want more in moderation. The, the, the thing with Tessera, and it, it's, it's kind of weird. I, I think the same thing would happen for me with Buff. The same thing would happen for me if there was more uh, more dominant genes in the hobby, which is, there's only a couple. Uh, it's a really exciting thing to see. But one of the things that excites me about a corn snake clutch is the diversity. It is the, the, the kind of what am I getting? And then when you start breeding a lot of Tessera, you hold back a lot of Tessera, you start getting a lot of Tessera. And Tessera does one thing that kind of pisses me off. And that's washes out a lot of the colors, the striping, the saturation of yellows that not a lot of other genes do. You see the same thing in Motley, but Motley's a little different because it's so variable. Uh, a clutch of pure Motley's, you're going to have 10 different snakes because they're all Motley, but every single one looks a little bit different, a little bit more unique to each other uh but that kind of clutch of tesseras and you have a whole bunch of tessera they kind of all look the same and mm-hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that because tessera is a strong gene and you can put tessera into certain things tessera anneries again going back to that just base gene annery uh tessera amels whoo tell me more about it uh motley tesseras oh my mm-hmm. gosh do i love motley tesseras uh you know there's there's things that happen with Tessera that are amazing, but sometimes you'll kind of crush your clutch with Tessera if you're shooting for that kind of vibrant, colory, uh, saturated look because it eats it, right? Yeah. You, don't, you don't you don't get that color variation and that kind of uh, contrast that we all love as corn snake breeders. Uh, but hell, it's, if we it's oh, go ahead. something that I would just like, I guess, with the Castagna stuff in particular, you know, that's what come to mind for me is like 
I do want to put Tessera into the Castagna stuff, but I think I want to get a better foundation of things that don't have Tessera in it first and then bring that in down the road. Maybe when yeah. I find that there's a combination or a, or a particular focus in terms of, of pairings and heads and stuff that maybe it would make more sense. You know, that being said, we took a Tessera, I brought it to a wild caught snake and got some of the coolest looking fucking snakes I've ever seen, which is really weird because I've put Tessera to, I, you know, I've, I've produced 200 Tesseras, right? Maybe, maybe hatched a thousand snakes over my life. And 200 of them were Tesseras. Half of them were Tesseras. <laughs> no, but let's say 200, 300 were Tesseras. A lot of them look the same pattern wise. Yeah. Yeah. And then you take a test run and pair it to a wild caught snake. And what? It just blows the tester out of the water. You get these crazy patterns and ch- chain links down the. Down, they are down, getting down the, better and better. Those are. Uh, uh, and Elizabeth, what we did was we took a wild caught Ladies Island corn that Justin had and a uh, tester ghost female that I had uh, mm-hmm. with no heads that we could find. I, I tested her for a couple different heads for a couple of years and uh, we got a bunch of testers and normals. Perfect, right? And oh my gosh, the Tesseros were, ah, they're just, they're different. They don't look like anything else. And I don't know what's going on. There's a lot of genetics at play and genetics are much more complex than we think are inherently. Uh, but you'll uh, have to send me pictures of those. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah. We, we, we're going to have to add you to the corn stars group chat. <laughs> you're, okay. you're, official, you're officially a corn star. Now you can, you're one of us. Awesome. One of my lifelong ambitions. <laughs> Of the three things: motherhood, good marriage, corn star. That's it. Uh, just don't, just don't tell people on TikTok that I'm a corn star. <laughs> I don't. I'm too old for TikTok. I don't even. Chris isn't hip enough for TikTok. I'm not hip enough for the TikTok. He's. <laughs> I don't know it. I don't get it. I don't have it. I've never seen it. So I get. I know what it is. I'm not dumb, but yeah, not a ticky. So, with that ghost Tessera girl, though, did you ever pair her to anything diffused? Uh, no. Okay, so there's so no hats that we are aware of. That basically. we're aware of, yeah. So we know that she's not, she shouldn't be het sunkissed. She's not het stripe. She's not het motley. She's not het amel or ultra. She's not het, hmm. I guess that would, that would be that side of the gamut, kind of the more like, things to be expected yeah. things to be expected she's not had any that she's not had email which was the big shocker for me yeah. uh because i was like well if she's she's at least had email right i'm gonna get some snows or ultra melds or whatever mm-hmm. she's not that uh so that that was kind of the interesting thing about her where did uh, she come from it's going back a ways isn't it it is she was produced <laughs> by you, you don't remember <laughs> no, I don't. I know who I bought her from. I bought her from Russell Southard, uh, who's very good about his genetics. He knows what's in stuff. And he told me she was Ghost Tessera. And I even have her slip that she came with because he usually sells a card with each snake if he's selling it to a breeder. Uh, he usually knows the – he produced her. Uh, so it wouldn't have been anything else in there. Hmm. Uh, I'm surprised if it came from Russell that it didn't have diffused in it. Or did you pair diffused to her? It has not paired been diffused. diffused. Uh, paired diffused well, this so year. How it long ago did you get the snake? Mm. Oh, I've had her five years at least. So five Russell years. had a major hard on for a lot of blood red stuff and a lot of lavender stuff. Okay. Both good genes. That's interesting because she was paired to a pied blood red male. This year? This year, yeah. That's what that first clutch was that I just got. So That'll be cool if it comes out. I'm, I'm happy if she comes out diffused. be some, some head granites, yeah. Yeah, before he really expanded his collection, I know that he had quite a bit of uh, blood red stuff and lavender stuff. Yeah, it seemed like of most of his stuff had blood red and lavender in it. Yeah, I got a few things. And he also did a lot of... Uh, his his big peak thing that he worked towards was uh, striped snow sunkissed. So he mm-hmm. had a lot of stuff that had either sunkissed snow, uh, a- sunkissed anery, amel, and stripe all kind of combined. Mm-hmm. And a few a few of my females that I'm bringing now are from him uh, that had combinations of all of those things. Mm-hmm. 
so yeah, she definitely doesn't have Motley or Stripe because uh, she did two years with me and bred both uh, either Het Motley or to a visual Stripe. So I'm still not sure exactly how the pied is going to work here with that pairing. Like I'm not expecting to see pieds. No, and and you shouldn't unless the animal you paired them to was Het Pied. So the 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 cuter like the blood would... reds you got from me are pet pied because the the female was pied. Right. But these would be het pied. So the animals produced by that clutch should be het diffused, het pied because pied right. is only visible through diffuse, but it's a it's a recessive gene. Okay. Uh, het hypo, het anery, and you'll get half tessera, half right uh, classic. Mosquitoes have officially come out tonight. <laughs> the mosquitoes are bad this year. Oh, yeah. Well, the rain we've gotten. We've gotten a, a more rain in Texas this year than we've gotten in, 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 in a decade. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Well, awesome. Well, this has uh, it's been very exciting. Are there any, any shout-outs or anything that you want to you wanna close up on? Like me? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm just I'm just a guest here. But people can follow you on Facebook at Burning Ember Reptiles. Oh yeah. Uh, and we're and on Instagram follow- too. And obviously TikTok. You gotta be on TikTok now. <laughs> no. I uh I watch TikToks, I don't post TikToks. No, we've got we've got Facebook and Instagram. They're both burning ember reptiles. Do you have an idea on how many clutches you're planning? Uh, you, you think we'll go this year, or kind of at this point because it's a late start, not really a, a good idea. Um, let me see. Let me count down the row. I'm like visualizing my rack and counting down the tubs. Eight, seven, eight, just in corns. Yeah. And then I don't even know about hog noses. Uh, at least one Splendida clutch and then the one gopher clutch. Nice. And that's not counting if anybody double clutches. A bunch of my corns double clutched last year. Um, I didn't breed them double, but I had a bunch double clutch off of retained sperm last year. Wow. Okay. See, I find that so bizarre because I have yet to have that happen with corns. I had Poor one bird. female. She she lost a lot of weight when she laid the first time, and I was thinking about purposefully double clutching some of my females, and she was one of them because I wanted to breed her to a different male um, to kind of hit on some different <laughs> genetics and prove out some of her genetics. Um, but when she laid her first clutch, she fell behind really bad, and I was like, "Oh, there's no way in heck I'm going to be able to double clutch you," and so I just. I fed her and we were packing up to go for a show one day and, you know, we were checking waters before we left and we opened the tub and she had another clutch of eggs. And I was like, you are going to die. Please don't ever do this again. Isn't that rough when they just look like an empty tube of toothpaste and you're just like, stop, stop, please stop. It was bad. I didn't brewmate her this year. I kept her awake and fed her and like fed, like rolled rat pups to her to put weight on her because she... She looked like she she was dead in the tub. She was so skinny, uh, but she's fine now. She looks like she did last year before she bred, but she scared the crap out of me. <laughs> they keep you on your toes. Uh-huh. They do that. Oh, Once you get too comfortable. Yeah, I'm I'm with Justin though. I've had so few double clutches and and, and and many many clutches I've had very very few, and I don't I don't know why I don't. I'm not, not entirely sure why, and hmm. maybe I don't pair up enough. Maybe I should pair them longer, keep them together longer. And, and This is my first time ever having double clutches. Um, huh. I, I don't know what happened last year. I guess there was something in the water in Palestine or something, or they knew yeah. that I was about to move, and they just wanted to give me a bunch of extra eggs. More stress. More stress. I don't know. Stress. More stress. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, and also, maybe seasoned breeders. Maybe a female that's been bred more seasons in a row, three, four, five seasons, made, made kind of do that inherently you know what i mean mm-hmm. i don't know get on the mommy track yeah get on the, they're on the train they're they're doing it they're I'm, I'm, I'm giving you these eggs if you want them or not uh-huh hmm. 
Well, this has been a wonderful episode, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming yeah. on with us. Absolutely, I enjoyed it. I- excited about what you've already done and what you're going to continue to do. Uh, you know, uh, amazing collection, amazing animals, and, and then you know, working with the importing. It's going to be a, it's going to be an awesome thing to see. Yes, we definitely look forward to it. I'm very happy to see where it all goes in the future. Opens a whole new. New door to Narnia. Oh, new world. Don't you dare close your eyes. What? Nobody watched Aladdin when you were kids? I, Aladdin I is my top is in my top three Disney movies, but I'm not going to sing in public. I'm not going to sing. Fantastic point of view. Right? I love that song. Me and my kid, we watch it. Vibes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this episode was brought to you by blackboxcages.com. Check them out. Facebook, Instagram. Use code THN at checkout. Save yourself some money. Get a rack, get a cage. Black box is all the rage. And then go over to silenthillreptiles.com. See what they've got, uh, especially here in the coming weeks. Uh, keep an eye out for Facebook, Instagram as well. And then shameless plug follow Fulvius Apparel. And yeah. it's on Instagram and Facebook. Look at that sweet hat you're wearing. That's awesome, man. Oh, man. What? My I head's too big. I got yours. I just got to ship it. Oh, wow. Weird. I got to ship it. So it exists. I have it. But, I'm excited. Um, we'll be back for Snakes and Stogies on Monday. Really need to get better about planning ahead for episodes there. But and Phil needs to get his internet issues fixed because Monday he just after a few minutes he just gave up. He's like, whatever. He's like, I'm done. He kept cutting out. And he just threw in the towel. So yeah. And also we're planning on trying to do a few more corn stars. Uh, my schedule's loosened up a bit, and we've got some mm-hmm. uh, some more exciting guests. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a, we've had a couple, and we're, we're planning on having a few more. So it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be very good. Looking forward to it. Uh, thank you, everybody. We will see you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.